Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to one and all. Uh, Jazakallah for um, being here this evening at Rumi Cafe. I'm Hassanain Abdullah, I'm from Okaf, and I'll be your host for tonight. I'm very happy that you are here and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'll be calling on my dear friend and my brother, Dr. Yusuf Patel, and he'll be per performing an opening dua. And he's also a representative of Rumi Cafe, so you'll also give us just a short address, Dr. Yusuf Patel. Al Fatiha. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Was Salatu was Salamu ala Ashrafil Ambiya wal Mursaleen. Sayyidina wa Nabiyana wa Maulana Muhammad wa ala Alihi wa Ashabihi Ajma'in. Rabbana Atina fi Dunya Hasana wa fi Al-Akhirati Hasana wa Qina Adab al-Nar. Allahumma Tahir Kulubana min al-Nifaq wa Amalana min al-Riya wa Al-Sinatana min al-Kadib wa Ayunana min al-Qiyana. فإنك تعلم خائنة الأعين وما تخفي الصدور يا مولانا يا رب العالمين إن فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله um, All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala First and foremost I would like to take this opportunity in welcoming everyone here tonight Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh on behalf of Rumi Cafe, the management, my dear colleague Tahir, who is not able to be here tonight, and all the staff, I'd like to welcome you here to our cafe, to our venue. We are very honored, we are very privileged to be collaborating tonight with Awqaf um, for this uh, prestigious event. Um, thank you for coming out on this public holiday, being here, honoring not only the venue, but also an illustrious personality within our community, and that is none other than the Honorable Shafiq Morton. Um, Uncle Shafiq, thank you as well for being here. Uh, I know from my previous interactions with you and discussions, and obviously with uh, our dear and beloved uh, Sheikh Siraj, who has passed on, Rumi was a central figure you know, in your life and in his life and in so many individuals. So, alhamdulillah, um, just a few words from our side. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Rumi Cafe uh, has been in existence uh, for only one week now. Tomorrow will mark one week. And uh, we pray and we hope that uh, our community here in Pinans and obviously in the surrounding areas will come and support uh, this venture, not necessarily only from a business or from a food perspective, but rather from a spiritual perspective. That was really our aim and goal for establishing this space. Um, we wanted to create an area, a place of ambience, whereby people could come in and instead of feeding, rather feel, rather enhance their spiritual uh, dimensions, such that when they leave the space, they leave better than what they came in. So food for us is obviously important. It's part of life, as we all know. But above and beyond food, the critical aspect for us is that people have a level of psychological well-being. So inshallah, we hope and pray that you will uh, support this venture. As we all know, Mulana Rumi, uh, or affectionately known in Turkey as Mevlana, was a paragon and personality of universality. And I think that's what the world needs today. And seeing that tonight's discussion will revolve around uh, the notion of heritage and our roots in South Africa and the great personalities and luminaries that have walked our land, I think it's important that we as Muslims uh, have an understanding of who our great personalities were historically. And one of the sad things for me, and I'll end sh uh, shortly with this, is that Mulana Rumi, being a Muslim, being an Islamic scholar, currently in the world is probably more read in the non-Muslim world than in the Muslim world. And I think we have a lot to do with regards to not necessarily reclaiming our heritage, but learning from these great individuals. And I'll just end by opening from the great work of Mulana Rumi in his Mathnawi, where I personally think it really sums up the uh, theme of tonight, the theme of heritage and of understanding where our forefathers came from such that we can become better as individuals within our community. And Mulana Rumi says, the opening couplet of the Mathnawi, let me tell you a story of the reed, a story of separation. Ever since I was separated from the reed bed, I lamented a sorrowful sound. 
everyone and everything that is separated from its source yearns to go back to its origin. And I think that really sums up the purpose and the value of understanding where we came from such that we will know where we are going. So Jazakallah Khair for being here tonight and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you to everyone involved. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We say Jazakallah to Dr. Yusuf for that uh, opening dua it was, uh, and his opening address. So inshallah, I'm going to share some information about OCAF South Africa. Uh, for those that don't know about OCAF South Africa, OCAF is a OCAF SA is a national organization and it is a charitable endowment receiving organization. It invests endowment funds and spends only the income derived, right? And it's used to fund a variety of community development projects and programs thereby um, promoting integrated community development and self-reliance. Some, uh, some of the projects that OCAF has been involved with recently has been around building social cohesion in our community through our uh, popular T20 tournament. It's been taking place over the last uh, five years. We've also been involved in healthcare interventions um, as well as interventions in education. And this brings us to uh, a, another important uh, a project that we are involved in, and that is the preservation of our history and our culture. So OCAF, we've been doing this through producing books. OCAF has a series of books under its Leaders in Legacy series, and we hope to be telling our stories right, through these books, celebrating some of our struggle icons and our forefathers. As a build-up to Heritage Day, uh, OCAF has been quite involved in some uh, programs. Alhamdulillah, last week we hosted an interactive session with Fahim Jackson Roder. He's very well known um, in uh, youth development and uh, through SILAT and the preservation of uh, our heritage and culture. So we did a special calligraphy uh, virtual session with him last week and we focused on the Tuang Guru Quran script, all right? So this was a build up to this event. From the Spice Islands to Cape Town, The Life and Times of Tuang Guru is a book documenting the history of the first Muslims at the Cape, and Tuang Guru was a spiritual leader of the community, and he gave hope to many slaves from various nationalities at the Cape during a very dark time. This book was published by OCAF uh, South Africa as part of his Leaders and Legacy series. And we have produced five books in this series. And Uncle Shafiko also mentioned uh, or provides some more information about our next book that's, uh, that's coming out. So it's something for you to, to look at. So as a society, we should be producing more books in terms of documenting our story or telling our story from our lenses. Many times you have the history and it's told from a Eurocentric or it's slanted towards Western civilization. So as a society, we should be producing more books and we should be reading more books and we should be inculcating this in our, um, in our upbringing of our children. So Alhamdulillah. So the Twanguru book, uh, this is the second edition of the book and lastly, Alhamdulillah, we did a tour of South Africa. We launched the book to a jam-packed um, uh, venue in Cape Town, Center for the Book, as well as Pretoria, Johannesburg, and can you believe it, in Durban, we had a launch of the book, um, and the there were actually people standing outside, um, and, and it, was, uh, it was storming, it was raining, and it was very well received at the, at the masjid also. Uh, there was good awareness that was created. And we also have the team from Adina Institute. They are helping us here today. So if you need to get the book, you need any questions, feel free to ask them. So I'm going to introduce Shafiq Morton. Shafiq Morton is a very well-known photojournalist, author, radio host of The Drive Time. It's a radio program that I definitely like. Uh, he chairs many uh, panel sessions. Uh, you'll see him on TV as well. He has traveled extensively. And he's the author of four books. And some of those books, just to make a mention, one of these books uh, was Surfing Beyond the Wall, Mercy for All, 
and from the Spice Islands to Cape Town, the life and times of Tuang Guru. And, 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 and this book essentially talks about the famous 18th century political exile, Tuang Guru, that was brought to the Cape by the Dutch. Uncle Shafiq will be giving his talk titled The Crescent at the Cape from Indonesia to Istanbul, our Kamisa heritage explained. Uncle Shafiq Morton. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum to everybody this evening. Uh, a special thanks to Rumi Cafe, beautiful tradition, to Hassanain from Okaf, to the students of the Medina Institute, and to everybody who has uh, taken the time out to come to listen to this talk this evening. Um, it's very encouraging to see that the Rumi Cafe, it's observing all protocols, but it's as full as it can be, and what a beautiful venue. It really is a stunning venue. Uh, this evening, my talk is entitled The Crescent at the Cape, From Indonesia to Istanbul, Our Kamisa Heritage Explained. I'm going to be talking from notes, which I don't normally do, but when you're trying to cover about 400 years, you have to, to restrain yourself a bit because we don't, I don't want to stand here for another 400 to explain what's been going on. So um, my pages are small. I will have to put on glasses because I haven't been able to put a Zuma script onto my... Um, do you know that Zuma, when he reads his speeches, it's done in 16 aerial font. It's very big. All right. Where do we begin? Um, Islam came to Cape Town, it came to South Africa, not via Da'is, not via people wanting to spread the word. It came to us via colonialism, but it came to us via a very strange kind of co colonialism at the time. I call it corporate colonialism, because in 1652, a company called the Dutch East India Company landed at the Cape with a man called Jan van Riebeck, who was a corrupt VOC official, and his way of redeeming his career was to come to the Cape, where nobody else wanted to go to. But it was very important for the Dutch because it was a halfway watering point between um, Amsterdam and between Batavia, Batavia being uh, Jakarta, in Indonesia. It was a very, very long journey. It used to take about uh, two and a bit months, 70 to 80 days to do the whole trip, the whole round trip. So what is interesting is that when Van Riebeck arrived, he, he, needed, he needed labor. He needed people to help him with his projects. And being a conventional racist, uh, he had problems from the get-go with the Koi or the Khu, which is the correct way of pronouncing who these people were. There was a man called Achumau who um, belonged to a tribe called Amakwa. And uh, in the Khu language, Amakwa means the water carrier. So they used to give the water to passing ships. And um, people used to get shipwrecked from the, not the Khamisa, the Khamisa River. And Khamisa in the Khu language means sweet waters that people can drink. Beautiful name. And the Hamisa River used to run from Table Mountain um, under, across Adelie Street into the Table Bay. And the early Hu used to provide water and supplies to passing ships. They, they did this for a hundred years before Van Riebeck even arrived. There's evidence that more, more than a thousand ships came past the southern tip of Africa before Uum Yan came. And also, incidentally, the picture you see on the Rand note, that's not Jan Frenberg. Jan Frenberg was an ugly guy. So they got another Dutch official, and they used his portrait uh, to represent Jan van Riebeck. So Jan van Riebeck is, is not the person you see on, on the coins and everything else. But on a more serious note, um, Muslims arrived here, number one, as political exiles, 182 of them, emirs, the Sufi sheikhs, the political advisors, the scribes, 
and the officials of the various sultanates of um, the Indonesian uh, uh, kingdoms or sultanates in Indonesia, 182 um, from uh, 1652 to about the 1700s. In addition to this group of people who were, by the way, learned, they were leaders, they were politically wise, and they were from a civilization. And let me emphasize this. The slaves that came to the Cape and the leaders that came to the Cape came from a pre-existing civilization. And if you don't believe me, go to Indonesia today. You will see far more impressive ruins of Hindu and Buddhist civilizations on the islands of Sulawesi and Java than you will see in Cambodia and Thailand. Very few people know this. So Indonesia itself was a cradle of civilization. It was a marine, it was an oceanic civilization. But I think we must remember it was a civilization, as were the African states where our slaves came from, as were, were parts of India and Ceylon or Sri Lanka as well. So from 1652 until 1795, um, the 18th, from the 17th to the 19th centuries, we had about 62,000 slaves arriving in the Western Cape uh, to serve the voice of the, not, not the voice of the Cape, the <laughs> Dutch East India Company. By the way, VOC um, also used to mean Ferhan onder corruptie. Um, that was a name that some of the disenchanted uh, Dutch Easter companies is to call their company going under corruption. All right, that's interesting, isn't it? Now, I'm going to sort of take a few historical shortcuts. I'm going to take us to 1780, when Tuan Guru, Imam Abdullah ibn Qadi Abdul Salam, who is an alim, He's a Sayyid, he's a direct descendant of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we've proved it in the book, the whole Sanad is there. He had um, learned the Quran, he was Hafiz al-Quran, but he was Hafiz al-Quran in the sense he could also write it. So in addition to being a memorizer of the Quran, he was also a calligrapher. He was also a faqih. He was knowledgeable on fiqh, aqidah, if you look at the book that he wrote called the Marifa, which is over 600 pages, you'll find from memory he wrote about the Aqidah of Imam As-Sunusi, which is the Ash'ari Tawhidah, Tawhid, sorry, which is the Tawhid that most of us have learned all of our lives. This is Tuan Guru. He comes from a very long tradition of scholars from that part of the world. I'll take you back to 1694 and Sheikh Yusuf of, of Makassar who came here in, in 1694. Recent research that I've been doing is starting to show that there could possibly be a link between Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar and the family of Tuan Guru. We can't prove it, but we are beginning to suspect it. The interesting thing about uh, Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar, because this is the line of Shayukh at the Cape, Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar was known as the Taj al Halwatiya, the crown of the Halwati Sufi order. That is not something that is very easily given or imbued upon a sheikh. He traveled around the to, to, to Damascus, he went to Medina, he went to Hadramaut and many other places to study. And when he was in Mecca, he used to lecture in the Haram. Again, very few shuyukh would be allowed to lecture in the haram of Makkah, and he was known as the Jawi Sheikh. Imam Abdullah Haddad, who is the author of the Ratib al-Haddad, or the Hajat, makes a note in one of his letters of the Jawi Sheikh of Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar passing through the city of Taiz. Now, what is interesting about all of these ulama that came to the Cape, and I'll get back to Tuan Guru, is that Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar did a lot of writing when he was exiled to Ceylon. He was exiled twice, to Ceylon and then to here. He 
conducted one of the longest jihads against the Dutch. But when you look at his writings, he doesn't mention the Dutch once. And I've read all his translations and everything that I can on him. He doesn't mention the Dutch once. And yet, he fought a jihad against them. And he came to the Cape under terrible conditions. So we have to ask ourselves the question, how did he resist? And the point of my talk is exactly how these sheikhs resisted the Dutch. Because they resisted the Dutch with the intellect, with the deen. Because if they rose up politically against the Dutch, their heads would roll very quickly. So let's fast forward to Tuan Guru, who arrives here in um, 1780. He immediately is sent to Robben Island. In fact, there's a bit of a comedy here because um, he arrives in the Zeepart, but the ship that had their papers was lost at sea. So when he arrived here, the Dutch didn't know who they were. They had no idea, so they just sent them to Robben Island until their papers arrived. And in letters that I've discovered, Tuan Guru writes about this, that he spent 24 hours in Cape Town and then he was on Robben Island. He was taken off the, off the island in 1781 and uh, the British came and uh, fought the Dutch at Saldana Bay, and then Tuan Guru after the battle, because all the ships had been sunk and taken by the British, he had to walk back to Cape Town, which took him 15 days. The interesting thing about Tuan Guru is that when he arrived here, he understood what was going on. Now, why did he? The slaves who'd come from an another civilization landed at the Cape. They were torn away from their families, Husbands had lost wives, wives' husbands, children had disappeared, uncles had lost aunts. It was absolutely chaotic. And in the slave ships, the, the, the people would basically sit in the excrement for 70 days on the way to the Cape in the bowels of these ships. And many would die. And they wouldn't know where their families were. They wouldn't know what their futures are going to be like. And they'd land in Cape Town in a terrible condition sometimes not even with clothes on. And, and these were sophisticated peoples that had been enslaved. I think we have to remember this, keep this in the back of our minds. The suffering and the anguish of the slaves at the Cape is difficult for me to put into words. I have um, done a lot of research on it, and it's horrific. So Tuan Guru knew what was going on because he was on Robben Island and then he went to the Cape Town and then he was put back on Robben Island a second time in, in 1786. So what did Tuan Guru do to resist the Dutch? What did he do for the community? He re realized that as a leader and he was a practiced diplomat, he had to comfort the people. So how did he comfort them? He wrote out the Quran from memory so for him his starting point was the quran but not in the usual sense his idea of using the quran was to use it as a comforter for everybody at the cape colony and later on in the talk i'll explain the effectiveness of what he did because how many people became muslim at the time um, of enduring tuan guru's life and shortly thereafter, the nature of our community. He also realized that the only way he could resist the Dutch was to reorganize a community, to in fact create a new community, which he did. He wrote out his Marifa, which is not the title of, of, of what he wrote. Um, the late Dr. Ahmad David saw that one of the sections of this book was called Marifa, and he called it that. Marifa means just knowledge of Allah, just to give a very simple explanation. But in it, there's, there's so, many, so many things in, in that work, I, it's not time to explain what's in it, but it's a treasure trove if anybody is conversant with Arabic and, and Malay as well. Now, he realized that education was the key. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that, to me, this is the prophetic model, to educate and to uplift and that was his primary purpose. And he did it under the noses of the Dutch. And he got away with it, which is so amazing. So what does he do? In 1793, 
Chuan Guru creates a madrasa. And that madrasa has 300 le students in it. Now, 300 learners in 1793 is it's a large amount of learners. I mean, Sachs, which was the uh, nascent University of Cape Town, didn't, you, didn't even have 26 students. Tuan Guru had 300. So the school was his departure point. And the interesting ab thing about the school was that everybody was welcome. There were no preconditions. So in the school, you would have children and adults from Africa, West Africa, East Africa, Swahili Coast, inland Africa. You'd have people from Ceylon, from Indonesia, um, from India, from Bengal, from all over the place. I mean, slaves at the Cape came from all different parts of the world, although certain population groups, the Indonesians, and the Africans were the, were the majority groupings within the slaves. So what did Tuan Guru do? He created the first model of non-racial education 200 years before its time. He was so far ahead of the curve. And I often um, think to myself, um, why has Tuan Guru never been given the freedom of the city? Anybody from the DA, please. Uh, tell them that, um, for, for what he did. I mean, he was the first urban activist in Cape Town to unite people, and that's what he did at the madrasa, and he later did it at the mosque. Very quickly, um, a lot of people say the Owl Mosque was started in 1794, whatever. Research reveals that permission was given for the mosque in 1804 by the Dutch. Um, when they came a second time, not as the VOC, but when they came as the Dutch government, because the VOC went bankrupt in 1795. My personal view is that he used the madrasa as a masjid. He could easily do that, because in those days there were no minarets, and if they didn't make a, a, a noisy adhan, ah, DA, look, look at that one, yeah. They didn't make a noisy adhan, so they could get away with it. So I think Tuan Guru created the masjid under the noses of the Dutch, they didn't know. I mean, the Dutch wouldn't know whether they were making salah or whatever. They just thought these are crazy heathens, so no problem. So I think the mosque, in effect, came into being before 1804, but the permission was granted in 1804, if you know what I'm trying to say. The other thing that Tuan Guru did was he built community. So what did he do? He appointed himself the Qadi. But this wasn't an ego thing. He was, he was a Qadi himself. He was qualified. And he appointed imams below him, the Khatibs, the Bilals, and the, the Ustada or the teachers at his school. So what have we got here? We've got the modern day construction of what our community is like today. And this is what Tuan Guru created in the late 1700s. This is his legacy. And I, keep, I just keep on wondering to myself, why do people not appreciate him more for the contribution that he made? I mean, life was not easy. And he had many, many obstacles that he had to face. Sadly, some of them from his own community. There's a character called Jan van Bugis, um, who I write about in my next book, about Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi. We'll talk about it a little bit later on. But um, it's, it's sad. I mean, that certainly hasn't changed. There were lots of informers in the community, even in the time of Tuan Guru, sadly. Now, if we look at his means of, of resistance, it was subtle, but at the same time, it was very assertive. Out of frustration, in 1797, as we say in the classics, he gets hatful. So he goes to the Kiyopini Street uh, quarry and he performs a Jumu'ah, um, open air, in defiance of the authorities. And remember, at this stage, a law called the Statute of India hadn't been revoked yet. The Statute of India said, if you practiced or propagated any other faith other than the Dutch Reformed one, you could actually be given the death penalty. But as a South Afrikaans, uh, Tuan Guru had the fail pluck, and he went, and he uh, performed this Juma'a. And you know what? He got away with it. The English turned the other way. They thought, uh-uh, we're not going to mess with this. 
and he set the precedent. So he was also a man of, of courage. Let me move on because my talk is going to embrace much more than Tuanguru. He passes on in 1807 at the age of 95. Um, it's a sad life. Um, he never saw his family ever again, although he asked for his two sons to come to the Cape because uh, he needed support, because he predicted that after his death, the community would have divisions. And a year after he died, there were divisions in the community. It's very sad. But by the 1840s and the 1850s, the community was in chaos. There had been no alim of his, of his caliber since. He taught his sons, he taught a lot of people, but they just didn't have the clout and the influence that he had to keep people together. So there was a lot of ignorance, a lot of jahl was starting to happen in the Cape. But it's not just a, a sad story because in the 1840s, 1850s, uh, the Dutch passed a ruling, or sorry, the British passed a ruling that uh, slave owners could not sell or buy Christian slaves. So what did they do? They said, slaves, you become Muslim. So the community got bigger, and it got bigger. And the irony is that in, in 1808, the British decided we are going to phase out slavery, but they were very clever how they did it. They said, we will put our ships off Cape Town, off Saldana Bay, and they put the naval fleets out there, and they used to capture slaves coming here from, from, from and the Portuguese and French ships from Africa. So what happened at the Cape, and nobody knows about this, from 1808 to 1860, more than 5,000 African slaves were dumped in Cape Town. But the British were clever. They said, no, we can't have slaves, so we'll tell these people they must serve a 14-year indenture period of labor. So the slave owners at the Cape were very happy because what does, it, what does indentured labor mean? It means forced labor. And these poor people were, were, were not really even paid anyway. So it was slavery in anything but name. They had to serve their masters for 14 years. Um, in some cases, they were lucky to only serve seven years before they have their freedom. Now, when Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around a lot because 400 years is a, is a bit of a, a tight squeeze. When Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi arrived here in 1863 and he was sent here to educate the community which had fall in, fallen into ignorance. And Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi, by the way, also was Sayyid from the Husseini line. And just this past week, I managed to locate his birthplace in Iraq. Um, a lot of researchers have got him in the wrong part of the world. So I've managed to find out where he was born. Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi um, studied 22 different subjects to become an alim. Amongst them, mathematics, philosophy, languages, um, music, uh, aqidah, everything. He was an alim in the true sense of the word, and he was also recognized as one of the top Ottoman scholars of his time before he was sent to the Cape. This is the caliber of the people that came to us. When Shah Abu Bakr Effendi arrives here, he writes a letter back to the Khalifa, and he says, this is impossible. In his letter, he says, there are so many different people here, there's so many different languages and so many different customs, he actually said in actual words that he felt like his mission would be like writing on water. He was completely intimidated by the challenges that he had to face. And for several months I've been asking myself, why? What happened? Wh how did the community change after the death of Tuan Guru? And that ties us up again with the arrival of these African slaves. They were called prize slaves, or in fact the British called them prize negroes, which is a derogatory term, 
because the prize meant that they were the property of King George. He owned them apparently. And they were indentured onto the farms and to do labor and work all around Cape Town. Now, where did these slaves come from, these people come from? And I've had to sort of uh, do research as far as St. Helena Bay, because some of them came from there, all over the place. They came from West Africa. They came from the Swahili coast, Mozambique, Madagascar, and even from northern Zululand, Uganda, Malawi, Botswana, Zambia. Some of the slave traders of the time, the Bemba of Zambia, um, in fact, my producer, Drive Time, Ibrahim is from the Bembas, and he remembers his forefathers being slave traders. And, of course, unfortunately, the Omani Arabs. Now, these five to 6,000 African slaves that arrived at the Cape became a problem for the um, authorities because what happened was some of them were Muslim and the other ones became Muslim. So much so that the Muslim community more than doubled itself in size in a space of 12 years. And very few historians have observed this fact. I don't think they want to. So Dr. Ahmad David says that in the 1840s, the community, uh, Muslim community was over 6,000, and that it was one-third of the colony. I think at one time Muslims must have been far more in terms of numbers at the Cape Colony. Because if you do arithmetic, it's only logical. I've got some interesting quotes from some very annoyed missionaries at the time and from the colonial authorities about who exactly our community is because only recently have I come to realize who exactly we are. And I don't think we've realized who we are all these years. And this is why I'm deliberately using the Hamisa theme because our African roots run very, very deep and I'm going to prove it to you. If one has a look at the numbers in the Muslim community before the uh, African prize slaves arrived, um, Robert Shell, a slave expert, says that from 1652 to 1807, 26% of slaves came from Africa, 25.1% from Madagascar, and Madagascar is regarded as African. Um, another 25.9% from India, and we've discovered that these slaves from India were not all Indian. Ahmad van Bengal, for example, actually came from Java. He was sold in Bengal. And I've seen Ahmad van Bengal's um, tombstone, which is Ahmad van Jawi from Java. Ahmad van Bengal was the Imam of Tuanguru. So what we've got here. We've got African percentage at 50%. Trafficked from the African continent. This is our community. This is the DNA of our community before these other groups arrived. So you can imagine the confusion of uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi when he arrives here being told, you're going to be teaching uh, a Malay community, comes here and he finds it's, it's basically it's African. Now, you may be asking, but where does this Malay identity come in? Let me explain that to you. Remember, the leaders, the ulama, the shayukh, had that Indonesian, as opposed to Malay heritage, um, in terms of Malayu, Bahasu Malayu being the lingua franca, <coughs> the language they spoke, and the way they educated. The point is that the leadership of the community was inherently, was Indonesian. All right, there's a lot of Indonesian DNA in the community. Don't worry. Don't worry, it's, it's there. But there's a lot of African as well. And who as well. So, what we have here, um, let me quote what some of the, the uh, missionaries said at the time. And it's very interesting. There's a guy called William Elliot comes here, and he's going to change the whole world. Everybody's going to become of other face. So he says... He, the slave, is scarcely more a member of Christian society than when he was an untaught heathen. 
There is a wide difference in colonial estimation between a Christian slave and a Christian man. It is not in the mosque alone that he, the slave, feels himself a social being. In every house inhabited by a Muslim, a Muslim he finds a home and a brother. Interesting. Our hospitality was making people become Muslim. Then we have an Imam Mooding. In 1824, he's testifying to a commission of inquiry by the British. The South African habit of commissions of inquiry wasn't started by us, the British started it. They loved them, and they never did anything afterwards about it. Emma Mooding says, in 1824, that at least half of the Muslims in the Cape Colony uh, were African prize slaves. This is one of our imams saying this. I, and I don't think that he was lying. So there is an admission by somebody from our community about the proportions of African Muslims in our community. Just some lubrication, I can carry on. High octane. <laughs> right, let's have another look at John Mason, an army officer often quoted about our community, and this is where it gets very interesting. John Mason says, and he comes in 1861, shortly before Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi lands on our shores, he says, um, if I can see in the light here, uh, this is not Zuma script. All right, he says, the amount of Malays proper, and it's his own emphasis in the Cape Colony in 1861 is 4,000. But he goes on, he says, um, the term Malay is applied to all Mohammedans, as he puts it, including Arabs, which he mistakes for Indonesians, Mozambican prize slaves, and Hottentots, excuse that phrase, and Christian perverts. And then concludes that the whole Malay community is 8,000 strong. Again, proof of the fact that more than half of our community was African. Then there's another comment by one of the census takers, they used to count the heads in the Cape Colony. And this is a government official who says in the 19th century, originally of Asiatic origin, the small class has become so leavened with foreign elements as to owe its distinctive existence rather to the bond of a common and uniform faith, Mohammedanism, as I always used to say, than to any feeling of race. Malay has to a large number of colonists among whom they live lost its proper importance and become synonymous with Muslims. Interesting. So what is the big takeaway from all of this? And let me start to conclude by another missionary coming here, John Arnold. And this is one that amuses me in particular, judging by my um, state of pigmentation. He says, um, he turns his nose at those of English or Scottish blood being called Malays and observes it is a terrible sight to see a European face dressed up as a Muslim. <laughs> All right. So my concluding remarks. Despite whatever our roots are, our comforters and our sheikhs, people like Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar, people like Tuan Guru, people like Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi and so many others, we have to remember that they are the people that created our identity by bringing us together as one people, as one Ummah, and Cape Town leading the way in showing how multinationalism can become one unique identity. My personal view is we can call ourselves Malays, but we are Cape Muslim. That is our identity. Um, in the same way that the Malays in Malaysia, when they say they're Malay, it's a whole gamut of people. In other words, it's people who are Muslim. So, to give you some more information, Patrick Talik Mellet, in his book, The Lie of 1652, observes that our community has 195 different DNA tributaries. And my feeling is that all these tributaries flow into the Hamisa, the sweet waters that we drink. And our links, as much as they may be European, Asian, or from the Far East, 
are also of the African soil. If we are Malay, we are Afro-Malay. If we are European, we are Afro-European. If we are um, whatever, we are Afro. Our primary identity is African. And I am very keen on us putting forward the idea, no longer say I come Indian, you are an Afro-Indian, you're Afro-Malay. Because where do you come from? You come from Africa. But at the same time, um, we have to look at the Hamisa. Who are the people giving water to the Dutch unconditionally? The who. And we have to remember them and we have to remember everybody who is born of the soil and is of the soil. And I think my concluding remarks are that as all South Africans, we all belong together. And if we look at the prophetic model and the model of people like Tuan Guru, Sheikh Yusuf and Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi, that the people, the community that's got all the tools to show the way, Rainbow Nation is nonsense. We are um, an Afro community. That's what we are. And I think the way that Tuan Guru should be remembered is that he created the first um, Cape Muslim identity. He created an Afro-Muslim identity. It's very unique, and I think we have to remember him for that. And in a sense, we have to honor ourselves, and we also have to honor other South Africans as well on this Heritage Day. I've spoken for far too long. Shukran for your patience. We say shukran to Uncle Shafiq for that uh, informative uh, address. And I really like the idea that uh, Tuang Guru was the spiritual leader at the Cape. And he led a very diverse uh, community. And it was a true example of the Rainbow Nation. I uh, hope you agree there, Uncle Shafiq. We are going to be calling on um, uh, Faiz Jacobs. He's an honorable member of parliament. And he's going to address us very shortly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Respected elders, uh, beloved brothers and sisters, uh, it's a beautiful evening in Cape Town, and Paya Shukran, Paya Tramakasi, Brother Safik. For those reminders of where we come from, today we celebrate Heritage Day. By the way, I'm Faiz, uh, a member of Parliament for the Greater Athlone area. Um, today we had many celebrations, and I, I met uh, Mikhail this morning at... Uh, at the uh, Awal Mosque, so we had like, this is my sixth event for the day. Um, <coughs> I want to say that uh, we have both a beautiful, crazy country where we can celebrate our heritage. And I think what we heard today was an important reminder of our history and uh, our stories. There's a lot of beautiful lessons in that stories. There's the stories of how we were oppressed as our people through slavery, through apartheid. But there's also beautiful stories of resistance, of people coming together, how our faith in the oneness of God, our faith um, and also the unity of, our, our, of empowerment also dro drove us. As Muslims, we might be numerically small in our country, but we play a very important, significant role in our country. And I think we today, I want to thank Okaf and uh, Mikhail and the team for, for telling our stories, reminding us of where we come from. Uh, this morning we heard about uh, Sarah van de Kaap and the beautiful legacy that she left there and the role that women played in nurturing our society. Even when we came out of COVID now, the role that you as mothers as grandmothers, as daughters, has helped us to just survive. And we want to salute our, our women also. Um, then I went to a, a memorial service of uh, a, a close comrade of mine, um, uh, Songezum Joli, who was the provincial secretary. And even though he was an African, he also understood what it was important to build non-racial solidarity in Cape Town. I shared... Uh, high school, so he was in, in Google Air too, and I was in uh, Mitchell's Plain in Beacon Hill in the 80s. 30 years ago, 
we as brothers crossed uh, our different communities and we said, look, as youngsters then, we must try to build a non-racial, we must seek to understand um, and that African solidarity. I'm, I'm pleased uh, uh, that we also talk about our Africanness because you know my family, they only re remember our Scottish and our German heritage. Uh, they don't want to remember our, our koi and our sand and our krusara and, and all of that. And, and we must embrace everything of us. We must embrace where we come from. We must embrace where we're going to. And so I just want to say a few words in, in celebrating today. I see you, my brother and sister. I, I, I celebrate you in all your perfect imperfections, wherever you might, however you might define yourself. And through understanding, through seeking understanding, we can build a better Cape Town. Cape Town is not what it should be. Cape Town is not what it should be. Cape Town is a, a deeply divided and unequal place. So our struggle, our jihad is not yet complete. We must come together as a people. We must unite. We must be able, and I see a very elderly crowd and I'm glad there's one or two young people in. <laughs> uh, we must learn from our elders. We must remember the good times so that during these difficult times, we can remember the good times, how we used to come together as communities and how, we, how, how better we were. And so I want to leave, leave you with those words and I just shukran for allowing me to come and to share a so few words with you. And uh, happy Heritage Day. And may our heritage, your story, my story, our story, brings us together as a people. Um, thank you very much. Shukran. We say shukran to Member of Parliament for the Greater Athlone Area, and that was Faiz Jacobs. We are going to be calling on OCAF SA's Deputy CEO, Mikhail Collier. Mikhail Collier has been very busy today. He was uh, at the unveiling of a very uh, important plaque uh, honoring um, some of our mothers, um, Sarah Fanakap, at the Owl Mosque. And our Deputy CEO, Mikhail Kalia, has been very involved in this project, right, in terms of the commissioning of the book and in terms of the production and so on. So maybe Mikhail can just expound a little bit more on the Leaders and Legacy series of OCAF and a li little bit about his experience at the unveiling at the Owl Mosque today. Mikhail Kalia. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. When we look at what OCAF South Africa does, we are basically a charitable endowment trust that establishes WACAF or endowments uh, for community sustainability. And one of the projects that we run is the Leaders and Legacies Project. And this showcases and captures in book form, in audio form, in um, uh, audiovisual media as well, the contributions and legacies that leaders from our community have made in order to impact and grow South Africa. And within this context, um, I was, my Friday afternoons and Saturdays uh, taken up by uh, kids and the cricketing um, projects that, uh, that we have to invest time in. And I received a call one Friday afternoon from Sheikh Ismail Lond, and he said, you have to go and visit Auntie Abdiya de Costa, who was currently 95 years old. Uh, she'll be 95 at least in December. And she was also at the program that uh, Faiz and I were, were, were at this morning. And still has her full faculties. She, in actual fact, from memory, uh, re um, uh, read out a poem that she had uh, written many, many years ago. And he said, you have to go and visit this lady. Uh, she's got a very important decision that she wants to discuss with you. And I thought, okay, at that time, 93 years old, something you don't put off for, for, for too long. And on the Monday, we went to visit her, and she said, I'm seventh, sixth or seventh generation Twang Guru, right, uh, descendant. And the first Tamat, or the first Quran uh, passing out ceremony took place in the house, which is two doors away from 
the Owal Masjid, which was endowed as a wakaf or as a, an endowment by Sada van der Kapp. And she said, I want to follow in that legacy, and I'm going to endow this property also as a wakaf for future generations to benefit from in the Bukab and the rest of, of Cape Town. And at that time, sorry for his, there was all this issues of Zuma that was, <laughs> that was going on and the battles that was taking place within the ANC within, you know, in order to ensure the survival of the liberation movement. Um, and I, just as an aside, some people think that um, the, the ANC is a political party, etc. But the ANC is an ideological movement that is made up of various strands. And sometimes the, you know, the, the issues that are playing out within the community or within the general South African society uh, showcases this, um, this, the difference within the, uh, the political party. And I'm not an ANC member, and I don't. I'm very critical of the ANC. But I am a political analyst by profession, so it is of interest to me these these different things that um, that have played itself out. And when we looked at what Ante Abdiya da Costa had, she had the manuscripts of Twanguru. She had his will that is written. Um, and many of us who wrote first Afrikaans uh, in the Arabic script, we will say it was Abu Bakr Effendi. But the document that Ante Abdiya da Costa had with her showed that Twanguru was actually one of the people that had written that. And I stand under correction, but I saw it with my own eyes, the date of his will um, and also a few other documents that was written in the Arabic Afrikaans script. So I then contacted Uncle Shafiq Morten and I said, you know, Uncle Shafiq, so many different things are happening within our community on a national level, within government. Um, and here is... It's almost a type of normalization of our history where we're seeing that the documents that this lady had on Twanguru, the type of work that Twanguru set about uh, institutionalizing Islam at the Cape, establishing a place for the oppressed masses to, to find themselves and locate themselves within a, f a space of freedom, of tolerance, of education. As Uncle Shafiq mentioned, he had a, a vibrant madrasa that was going on. And I told Uncle Shafiq, we have to write the story. We have to get our community back to the basics of what uh, we had lost over a period of time. When we were growing up as children, we were told by our parents and our uh, madrasa teachers that you've got an angel on your right and an angel on your left-hand side that's writing down your deeds. And you tell our children this today and they will think you're talking, you know, spook stories. It's, it, it's, it's not there. And it got us thinking to say that it's not necessarily that the angel is on your right and your left, but what they were instilling within us is a sense of accountability. Accountability within family, a husband to his wife, a mother to her children, a political leader to, uh, to the people that he, that he serves or that she serves, and generally the, the issue of leadership accountability. And we then set about this very important mission. And the book that you have in front of you is going to be, inshallah, one book in a mini series, a long series on the leaders within the Cape uh, uh, Muslim community and also the general community. I think thus far we've written about 10 books. A uh, book on Enver Surti, who is the past uh, Deputy Minister of Education and also for a period of time the Minister of uh, Justice. Uh, there's books on Isma, Judge Ismail Muhammad, the first Chief Justice of South Africa. There are various other books that have been written. And this is important for us because a, a community that does not know its history is going to be doomed. Shafiq spoke about identity. Our kids, we need to instill this proud identity within our community. And as we mentioned this morning, we stand, our forefathers did not come here as colonizers. They did not come here as imperialists. They did not come here to steal and plunder the resources of this country. They came here as political prisoners. They came here as exiles. They came here in, the, can you imagine sitting in a dark ship for 70 days, right? Coming to a foreign place where you don't know anything, but yet you have the courage 
and the conviction to still contribute to the growth and development of the society that you're living in. Whatever you find within Cape Town, within town, uh, Bukab area, it was built by these very slaves who were exiled. And yet you have this um, um, heritage that today, I, and, and I feel very sad that and maybe if uh, Comrade Faiz, you have got to take it up within your government circles, is that we cannot uh, reduce our heritage to a national bride day. Our heritage is much more than burning a piece of meat on a fire, right? And I think it starts with each one of us who are sitting here, who are conscious enough to come to this particular gathering in order to learn, and the takeaway from it is we need to reignite our communities in order to showcase that we have a proud DNA, that we have a proud legacy in South Africa, and that we will continue to contribute. Shukran, assalamu alaikum. We say shukran to OCAF's deputy CEO, Mikhail Khalia. He's been very busy today, and we really thank him for his address. And it's very heartwarming to see that, uh, you know, as I um, look across, uh, you know, the gathering here, there's lots of um, Twanguru's family and lots of people that have also contributed to the publication and the production of the books. So we're very appreciative for that. So now we're going to be having a Q&A session. The, the focus has been much on the, the coming of Twanguru and the legacy live. Um, <coughs> is uh, maybe if I don't know, will there be kind of a opportunity to further expand on the contribution of uh, Twanguru, like his sons and uh, his descendants, uh, to Cape Town? Because we know, for example, um, his sons they built a mosque in uh, Nurul Islam on Baitan Kharam Street and. There's also much uh, history connected to it and other waqaf property that was established through the Twanguru family. And maybe that can also be explored. And I would like to know the input of uh, Uncle Shafiq regarding this, inshallah. Uh, shukran for that question. Uh, the funny thing about Q&As is that they always assume the person who's being asked the questions has got the answers. But uh, um, on a more serious note, uh, Shia uh, Appleby, um, in fact, the grandson of Twanguru, um, was an imam himself, Abul Rakib. And he was quite a feisty youngster. In fact, he was an imam, I think, when he was 17 years of age. And he was a student of Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi. And he was a central figure in the Juma'a um, rows that occurred. Uh, he went to the masjid and he said, I am going to do the, the, the Juma'a according to the Hanafi madhab. You know Imam Shafi, wouldn't have to tell you, you have to have over 40 people or whatever for, to constitute a Juma'a. Abu Hanifa, Radul Hanifa is more lenient. You don't have so, so many people. And for performing the Juma according to the Hanafi Madhab, uh, the people at the time in the Cape, they gave him an extremely tough time. Um, but he fought back and he won a court case. And Sheikh Abu Bakr Effendi um, testified in that. Uh, in the book, in fact, one of the chapters of the book is dedicated to the contribution of Tuanguru's family. And um, talking about the family is another 10 books. Um, they, they certainly have made their mark on, on, on Western Cape uh, uh, culture, on our dean. They produced a number of scholars, uh, Hufath, etc., etc. Some people of great spiritual strength and skills. But um, I do, I'm advertising the book here, but in, in one chapter you'll find that I do talk about the family of Tuan Guru. It's become a very big family. And as I say, um, the challenge is out to anybody else who wants to write a book about his family because there is a book there that can be written most definitely about it. Definitely. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Can mm. Uncle Shafiq perhaps expand a bit on what was wrong with Jan van Bochis? Because he did have the support of O France, the old imam that got the, the Tanabaru land. Yeah, no, that is an interesting question because I've just been researching it. Um, it's a long story, but Jan, Jan van Boogies is an interesting character. Um, he comes uh, to the Cape as a slave, <coughs> and he marries uh, a woman who is a freed slave, and she frees him. But he was apparently an Arabic teacher in Tuan Guru's madrasa. Now, he felt that he should have been the next Qadi, 
And we can't find out why he, he believes that, and I've been trying to find out why, and I cannot. But for some reason, he felt that he should be the next Kadi. Now, Tuan Guru had a big problem with it, because on his deathbed, Tuan Guru told Imam uh, Ahmad van Bengal and others, do not ever appoint Jan van Bugis as Kadi, otherwise you will have to answer for it on Yom al Qiyama. words to that effect. It's a very startling statement by a sheikh who is in fact a Sufi who would normally be quite soft. So Jan van Bugis must have done something. The only explanation I can come up, there are several. The, the Bugenese are a very interesting people. They originally came from Sulawesi, but they were put into a diaspora or a wandering when the Dutch took over um, Makassar in 1669. So the Bugenese people were, were sailors. A lot of historians say they became pirates. Nonsense. What they were doing on, they were fighting the Dutch on the ocean. So the Dutch just called them pirates. That was resistance. There is a difference. Um, they will have also been described as a very fierce people um, for, for whatever reasons. It could be Orientalism. I don't know. But I discovered that the, the Bugunese had completely different customs to the people of the Moluccas or Tidori and Tenarti, the islands from which Tuanguru's family comes from. Um, the Bugunese were very status conscious compared to the people from Tidori and Tenarti. And the one, the Spice Islands used, used to um, take taxes from Sulawesi, from where the Bugunese came from. So the Tuanguru's people used to rule over the people of Sulawesi. So I don't know whether it's a political resentment, whether he thought, okay, well, I'm going to get you back. Because also at, at that time in the Cape, there were a lot of, a lot of the, the Indonesian slaves were Bugunese. So maybe Jan van Bugis thought he had a majority here. Maybe he thought he was a politician or something. I don't know. But nevertheless, um, Tuan Guru predicted all of this. And that's when he wrote a letter asking for his two sons to come to the Cape to help him because he knew that Imam Ahmad van Bengalen would struggle to keep the community together. Franz van Bengalen, and we don't know what his Muslim name was. We don't even know whether he was from Bengal. His name could have been Ahmad for all we know. Um, was um, an assistant to uh, Tuan Guru. And after the palm, tr the palm tree mosque had lasted for a year, uh, the imam resigned, the whole jamaah came back to the old mosque, and Franz van Bengalen went to Batavia, never to be seen again. Ahmad Davids told me many years ago that Franz was so embarrassed he just left the Cape because of Jan van Boogies. I've got a chapter on Jan van Boogies in the next book, Nice advert. Um, he's an interesting character. But he's not completely a villain. You know, in real life, the villains have also got good points. And in his defense, um, he used to buy slaves and then uh, free them. So look, it's not all bad. But, you know, two, three hundred years later, it's quite difficult. I can't go say, Um Yan, what happened? You can't tell me he's in the grave. <laughs> so I think the, the first comment is, um, Uncle Shafiq Morton and Okaf and, and everybody that's here, I think uh, this is a very special occasion for many different reasons. I think the one thing that does come to mind as I'm sitting here is that I'm not that old. Um, somebody said we've got an old crowd. I'm not that old, but... We'll grant you that, don't <laughs> worry. I, I, I come from, a, a, I think, a, an age group that grew up in South Africa on, I call it that cusp, that threshold of the old South Africa and the new South Africa. So our history books basically wrote about Jan van Riebeek, 1652. And over time, uh, my father, Muhammad Amin Hasim, who was the son of Imam Muhammad Noah Hasim, uh, is, and like many that's sitting around the table <coughs> here, like Dayan on the table next door, and Auntie Salma Arendt that's sitting next to us here, we have met during lockdown on the digital platform. You know, the Tuanguru Facebook page and so forth, and that's how we connected. Mm -hmm. But the, the comment that I want to make is that the history books in South Africa, and I think everywhere else, is written from the one who conquered, not the one Absolutely. that was conquered. So, shukran for your efforts 
and for the support that everybody has been given you to give us the view of, I would call it, the other side, the true side, the real side. Because, you know, the verbal history that exists within our communities over years, you have captured all of that in books like this. And inshallah, we will continue to do that. Not just with Tuanguru, but I think with everybody else that has contributed to, uh, you know, to, to South Africa. I think the, the other comment that I want to make is the digital platform that's available for us. I, I'm using the word us if you don't mind because I don't see this as a singular effort. It's a, it's a collective effort. All right? How do we reach the masses out there? Because if I look at my, my kids, my boys, they are very much in the digital era of social media, of Facebook, of Twitter, and so forth. How do we get publications like this, and how do we create a platform like this to engage with that, I'll call it that age group, that, that era, so that stories like this don't end up only, with all due respect, with people our age, and then over time it dies out again. How do we continue to, you know, to, to nurture that, to nurture that, and I think I just want to point out to Auntie Salma here and to Dayan, who I met over the last few months. In fact, tonight is the first time I'm meeting them in person. So, Salma's done great work, believe you me. That, that I think the, the, the efforts of everybody that is contributing in whatever way, it needs to be, I, want, I don't want to say celebrated, because then you, know, you walk around with a chip on your shoulder. It's more about how do we create some movement to get the message out there so that we create a movement, not in an age group that you are seeing around us, but I think within an age group that is coming up through the ranks. And, and I think for me, that is very important. You mentioned Sachs and you mentioned the, the historical nature of Tuanguru and the madrasa of 300 students versus the Sachs boys that maybe had by 10 or 18, I don't know, 20, 20 students. Those are significant stories that we need to get out there. As an example, them, them obviously there are many others. Um, and uh, I think the, the only question I have then in that regard is the digital platform. The, the hard copy is great, you know, we're gonna support that. But how do we drive the digital exposure of the, the stories of the Cape? Yeah, that's a good question and thank you for all your comments and I'm glad you mentioned. In fact, Salma and Sohail were great help in uh, the Sanat of Tuan Guru uh, when I was uh, doing the book. I mean, the, a book is often teamwork and the support of Mikhail, the patience of Mikhail and Hassanain running around like a chicken with his head cut off. He's got his head back now, it's all good. And uh, everybody else. But um, what I did with this book was, in fact, I did a reading of it. In fact, when we sold the original copy, it came with a CD. And it was interesting that I got more responses from the CD than I did from the book. Uh, you know, people could put it in their car and that kind of stuff. So it seems as if that is, is one way of doing it, but are people going to be prepared to, prepared to listen to it for that long? I personally think we need to get this kind of history into the mainstream. If you look at the syllabuses that are in the schools, it's shocking. Not enough work has been done in... Re rewriting and recreating our history in terms of decolonization. The biggest challenge I, I have now in my research is decolonizing the information because a lot of the information comes from oriental or colonialist sources and they are very jaundiced in their way of thinking and their observations. I mean, calling, uh, for example, uh, Christian uh, reverts to Islam, calling them perverts, for example, that kind of stuff. You have to read through all of that. Uh, you know, to give you a brief answer, I think this has to go mainstream, and I think what OCAF is doing, not just because I've been involved, is I think is the way forward. How we engage with our youth further on, I'm not as young as I used to be. I think young people themselves have probably got the answers once we give them the information, if it answers your question. Uh, okay. Salam's Uncle Shafik. Salam. It's Atiyah here. Yeah. Right. I wanted to thank you for all your help. Um, with the article I just wrote, which just came out about this particular topic and the history of Islam uh, in the Cape and also the importance of this calligraphy. Um, so part of the research for the book that was kind of new was uncovering the letter that 
goes against the notion of how long Tuan Guru stayed mm -hmm. on Robin Island. And so just to talk about these family heirlooms in the forms of scripts and um, manuscripts, uh, kitabs, letters that are actually sitting in houses in Cape Town that maybe many people are not able to decipher. They don't know how important the information is that's held on them. So this is one thing that as researchers, we have to like go and dig and find and translate. So how important do you think it is from your perspective of as a researcher finding these untold histories that are lying still around Cape Town? It's absolutely critical. You know, the story of how we discovered this letter is an amazing story. Um, I was at a function and I was talking about the fact that I was writing a book about Tuan Guru and the person next to me started smiling. And he said, Shafiq, do you want to see a copy of Tuan Guru's Quran? I said, yes, definitely. And I gave him my card and I forgot about it. And he turned out to be a member of the family. And about six weeks later, he said, come now, right now. Um, I've, I've, I got the Quran and I went to the house and there were a whole lot of kitabs on the table. And I took my camera and I took as pictures of everything that I could. Because one of the problems that we have is that the families are not keen enough. They don't trust us researchers. They don't want to give us the material. And there are so many copless booker and, 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 and books in people's cupboards. And I make an urgent plea to anybody, let us researchers have it. Let us give it to people who can translate these works and in, enrich our history. But as I was going through these kitabs, a piece of paper fell out of a book that was a, a, a thick book written by, by Tuan Guru. And I opened the letter and I took pictures of it and I started reading it and I realized, but this is not Arabic, this is, I, I couldn't make head or tail of it. So I said it to a friend of mine, Professor Michael Luffin from uh, Princeton University, who uh, was known to Salma as well and members of the Abdurraouf and uh, Rakib families, because he was also researching Tuan Guru. I sent him that he's in Australia. He woke, he was so excited at three o'clock in the morning, he started translating. A Professor Luffin um, is conversant in Arabic and Malayu. Perfect combination. And he, 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 at three o'clock in the morning, he translated the letter, and the letter is Tuan Guru writing home and explaining that he arrives here He's taken to Robben Island. He's there for a year. Then there's news that the British are coming here, Commodore Johnson. All the, all, everybody's taken off the island because they're scared the British are going to take it over. The exiles, seven of them, are sent to Saldana Bay because the Dutch don't want the British to get hold of them. The British arrive in Saldana Bay. They wipe out the Dutch. They take all their ships away. But what is interesting about this letter in the letter, he explains what's happened. Two people came with him, Badruddin, who was a scribe, and, uh, sorry, Nuruddin, and uh, Qadi Abdurraouf. Qadi Abdurraouf and Nuruddin got into a rowboat and went to the British ship, and the British took them on board, and they actually escaped. And Imam Abdullah, Tuan Guru, and Badruddin, who was a scribe, had to walk back to Saldana, but, and he writes about this. So for the first time, I actually saw the voice, the actual voice of Tuan, and it was such a moment, a moving moment, to hear the real voice of this man talking about his conditions and um, explaining what happened. Then when you look at the, the Marifa, you know, there's a thing called a colophon. It's a V that comes to the bottom. And I was able to look at it, and there he says, I'm from Bilad La'ana. I'm from a country of suffering, of sadness. Then in other parts of, of, of this work, he refers to himself as the oppressed imam, the son of Qadi Abdus uh, Salam, etc., etc. Just those words are so profound. Why is he saying this? Well, obviously, we know why he is. But when you see it actually written on the page, it really hits the heart very, very hard that you realize that these people were really under the most difficult of circumstances. They were really suffering. And I think that there are, there are more, there's more material at this particular home in that ceiling are the stock, are the pens that Tuan Guru used to write with. He wrote with bamboo pens. He used to make his own pens. 
There's, there's other stuff in that, and unfortunately, I don't want to get into, into family politics, they have shut their doors, there's no more access. It's sad. Um, and with other families as well, um, I, as researchers, we don't understand why are people hanging on to this stuff. As researchers, we can restore the manuscripts, we can take digital copies of them, and we can work from the digital copies. We don't want the originals. It belongs to the families. But the information, I believe, belongs to the ummah. It belongs to us. I'm absolutely puzzled, for example, why there are no copies of the marifa is not freely available. Why are families hanging on to these documents? I make the point in the book that if our uh, ulama, before they go overseas, if they were to study the marifa, they wouldn't come back as confused as they sometimes uh, come back. And I say that with the deepest of respect because the people who go to study are very sincere. But if anybody is educated from the marifa, it's difficult to go wrong, really, because it's a basic textbook of Islam. And when you see the hadith that Tuan Guru uses, um, he's a master, he's a master da'i. I mean, he chose the hadith that were appropriate. His selection of Quranic ayat, for example, masterful. He doesn't choose the conventional ones. He uses unconventional ones, and then he goes to the conventional ones, all talking about suffering. Recite this, that this relieves your suffering, etc., etc. Why are we, not, are we not teaching this book? I don't know. Can we assume we always hear about slaves, especially from, from overseas, Indonesia, Madagascar, and so Can we assume that the slaves were always men, males? No. And did they, did they come here and then marry Children. the African women from here? Um, Children, so yeah. Yeah, were the, were the slaves always men? No. Um, in fact, the one slave ship came over 1,360 children from St. Helena Bay. Children. And nobody knows where they went to. Uh, I discovered one source that says that they believe that the Muslim community took them in. <coughs> Which, you know, goes to show, and obviously they must have become Muslim. Over 1,300 children on a, one, on a ship. Um, the interesting thing is there was a lot of intermarrying. And there are some of the Malayists, I'll call it that, who have been criticizing me very heavily for saying that our community had a relationship with the Hu. Now, where are the Karamits? They're next to streams, they're next to rivers. There's a cattle trail that goes from the city bowl <coughs> over Kloof Neck, along the Odakral Ridge into Hout Bay and Nordic. Who used those cattle trails? The Hu. They showed our um, exiles, you know, the, the escapees. They showed them these, these, these pathways um, where they go. And wherever you find the Karamats, they are close to, to areas that the Hu used to either graze their cattle, used to water their cattle, or they used to hide. They showed our people where to hide. What about uh, um, Said Abdul Malik, who's buried at St. Cyprian's? He was a herbalist. He comes from Indonesia. He's not going to know which plants to use. How did he know which plants to use? Who would have taught him? The herbalists of the Hu. And there's another thing about our tradition. You know, people talk about guma. That's not a Malay word. It's an African word that comes from ngoma. Sangoma is one of the derivative words. Ngoma is a, a nguni word, originally kalanga. Bakoni word for drums. Where does this come from? Because when the people used to perform the ratip, they used to, they used to drum. And the Swahili slaves, who were Muslims, also used to perform the ratip. So when they came to Cape Town, when they saw the, the, the so-called Malaysian ratip, ah, this is our people. That's uh, The ratip, by the way, played a great role in, in keeping people together, as bizarre as it became, because at the end, some of them used to go to the pubs, get drunk, and kill each other in the ratip. They used to get so excited. But that's another story. And uh, that's one of the things that Sheikh Abu Bakr had to, to address. You know, things were getting out of hand. But originally, that's what brought people together. So, sorry, just one, just two more questions. One is just pertaining to the wife of uh, Tuanguru, mm. uh, if it was Kwe. The second part, because I just spoke to my aunties now, uh, they are the descendants of Imam Durakib. 
but there's a property in uh, District 6 which relates to the Beitengraft Mosque. So uh, how is it possible for us, what is mentioned here, there is important, uh, say, assets or memories connected to the Tuanguru, and it's for community to remember. So how is it possible also as a community we can support each other to reclaim this property that was uh, made waqaf, but many people don't know about it, except in the family. And I'm sorry, is, is this plot, is it in Fandelier Street? Ferrier Street, Ferrier Street. It's Fandelier Street. No, there Ferrier was a, yeah. Fandelier Street, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, mm. lives there, uh, Fuldain Rakib. So but, I, I, I but, tell yes, the but, story. Uh, but uh, Ferrier Street was the place that uh, Imam Durakib bought mm. after the the court case in Beit Yeah. So uh, yeah. So I just want to know, like, is because we are busy with the land claim issue, but how is it that the, the community itself also can support and assist in this regard? Because I think that is the only living space uh, we can say that connects to Anguru directly, uh, because our mosque is obviously connected to Sarkif and the Kaab. Mm. But uh, the property in District 6 is connected directly to Imam Durakib, and which is the grandson of the uh, Tuan Guru. So, okay. Yeah, there's an interesting story that okay, um, Tuan Guru's wife was, they used to call her Khaj de Van de Kaap. I think it was Khadija. Van de Kaap means that she was born in Cape Town. And to be honest with you, um, I haven't been able to find out what her identity was. So we, we don't really know. Van der Leeuw Street was um, in, uh, uh, up in District 6 above Trafalgar, um, the school. There used to be a, a water course there, and that was the first place they applied for a mosque, in 1800 actually, and it was turned down by the authorities. Uh, they felt that if they applied for a mosque in Van der Leeuw Street, away from the city, it would be away from the attention of the authorities, because in those days that was like the countryside. So... Um, it's the, the, the fact that uh, fund, uh, Imam Rakip was, had a home there is, I find, very interesting. I think, the only th I'm not a land uh, restribution expert, but I think gather as much history as you can, uh, go to the Heritage um, Association, maybe go to the Cape Archives, maybe you can get ownership documents to further, to further your cause as far, as far as that is concerned. About the madrasas that would happen in the dunes along the coast and at that time the only thing that I can only places I can imagine that would be would be up Table Bay north and in the south by Sunrise Beach and 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 onwards from Musenberg. Yeah you see I mean our community what became very spread out and remember you had uh, uh, Sheikh Nurul Mubin an Oda Kral you had uh, uh, Said Atuan Jafar also an Oda Kral and if you go there you'll find there's lots of graves. There were communities there, active communities, living out of the eyes of the Dutch. So Sheikh Nurul Mubin and Sayyid Tuan Jafar must have stayed there. There's, there's a story, I can't prove it. They say Sayyid Tuan Jafar was actually killed by the British when they found him there. We, I can't prove it. But what was probably happening there was that the runaway slaves or the community was going into these areas and doing their lessons there. Because remember, the Statute of India banned the practice of any other religion other than the Dutch Reformed one. So there's probably a lot of merit in, in, in what, you, what you've heard. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We thank you for your interaction, your feedback, and your questions. It definitely added value to the, um, to the program, inshallah. And just to add to the question that was uh, posed by uh, the person at the back in terms of you know, taking the, the book into the digital platform and so on. So, inshallah, we do have plans in, in place. We do have a podcast or audio edition of the book. So, we are in, we do have some um, plans to, to get the book to either the Kindle or online version. So, we do have an audio book of that. So, um, look forward to that. Inshallah, we're also working very. Um, uh, tirelessly in the, in the in the background to um, simplify the book and, and and also get this book into curriculums for primary school um, going learners as well as madrasa. So we're very um, involved in that because essentially 
we have lots of the older generation that's reading the book, but what about the younger generation? They should be taught this in madrasa in primary school, right? High school is a little bit too late. So, so with that in mind, yeah, OCAF, we uh, at OCAF we're very committed to to getting the message out there and preserving our collective history. I would like to thank the OCAF SA team, namely Uncle Zainu Abedin Kaji, Amika Il, we, we have Nazmi Schroeder, Shireen, and the rest of the team. And we also like to thank uh, Rumi Cafe for, uh, for hosting us here today. The students of Medina Institute, they were very helpful when we had the book launch in 2019. And they're also here to assist us today, so uh, they will be assisting you if you need to purchase the book. The book is available, and Uncle Shafiq will, is on standby now to do some book signing, and it will personalize the message in, the, in your book. So with that, I would be rounding up. But I'll just call on uh, Zaid, a representative from Rumi Cafe. Uh, I think he just wants to do also a vote of thanks. So we call on Zaid from Rumi Cafe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mulweni, bantu basikaya, meaning good, good, good evening, my family. Um, from from us here at, at Rumi Cafe, um, we want to extend a, a heartfelt thanks to Oka for presenting this opportunity to, uh, to us. Funny enough, we, we find ourselves is a site of heritage, which is some people know as the old um, police station. But before it actually became a police station, it was actually holding cells for detainees. Um, I think Chief Langbelelele, which is a Corsa chief, which was detained on the oval behind us. And as you pass through this little entrance over here, the two shops on the side, there is actually two jail cells that was actually housing those uh, war criminals or uh, from the Ang Anglo-Boer War. And um, it's good to, to actually feel a bit nostalgic and being part of history, being located in such a place of rich heritage. But please enjoy the space with us for the future and hope to have many more of this as well. Thank you so much. I would also love to thank Uncle Shafiq for his very informative talk and also sharing some of his findings leading up to the uh, production and the publication of the book. And may Allah increase you in your health and may you be with us for a long time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.